All right, so Psalm 56. Would you pray with me? So Lord, we thank you and praise you for your kind grace and your favor. I pray that as we open your word today, I pray that you would teach us truth. I pray that you would fill us with your peace. I pray that you would remind us that you're the God that we can trust in. In Jesus' matchless, holy, and powerful name we pray. Amen. So I want you to think about this, that this psalm was written, um, if you get a chance to read in 1 uh, Samuel chapter 21, David is on the run uh, uh, from Saul. Um, David has been anointed king over Israel, and he has fought Goliath already. Um, David has been getting praise um, from others. But now Saul, knowing that David's going to be the anointed king, he is angry. He's jealous. He went on the attack against David. He has to leave his homeland. He needs to leave his people behind because he's afraid. And David is going on this run because he's afraid that Saul's going to kill him. And I guess Saul, in essence, is thinking that if he kills David, that he will be king over um, Israel again. So David is running. David has left his people. And as you will see in 1 Samuel chapter 21, David has now gone to the Philistines in Gath. Now, it's interesting why David would go running um, to his enemies. He's running from his own people, and he's now running to the land of Gath. And if you remember Gath, that was the place where Goliath lived. And we know um, of David's life, and we know that David killed Goliath. And it's a remarkable victory that God has provided for David and for God's people. But he's running to his avowed enemies, and it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Now, I'm thinking this, that David recognizes that there are probably not, there aren't pictures during that time. So nobody has a picture of David. So he thinks he could probably sneak into the city and hide out there and Saul will never come into, the, into Gath or into the Philistine territory. But the problem is, is that David is not really thinking very clearly here. He actually goes into the city with Goliath's weapon that he had gotten in the chapter before. So he goes in with Goliath's weapon into Goliath's hometown, and now it is pretty clear that David is on the run, and the Philistines know who he is. So, so David recognizes now that he is in great trouble here in um, the Philistine territory. And so what David actually does is he acts like he is crazy. He lets spittle run down his, his beard and he, he acts in a crazy way. And the king of Gath says, I've had enough crazy men, let him go. And then David runs into the caves of Adullam. And that is where he in all likelihood is writing this psalm. So let's start with this. In verses one and two and verses five through eight, we see he says this, be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. And so what we see here is that David is crying out that, God, please be gracious to me. And in essence, that's exactly what we need to be doing right now, even as we're going through this fear. Now, this psalm is talking about a fear of man, but there's also other fears that we have to deal with, uh, a fear of loss, a fear of death, a fear of sickness. And many of us are going through some of those um, struggles right now. We're afraid for our family. We're afraid for our own lives. We're afraid for our livelihood. And what we need to do is to cry out to God and beg God to be gracious to us. When God is gracious to us, God is giving us something that we do not deserve. It's unmerited favor. It's undeserved favor. It's unfathomable favor as well. And David is saying, recognizing that if he's ever going to get grace, it's going to come from God. He says, be gracious to me. And he's saying, be gracious to me because my enemies are pursuing me. You'll see this in verse 2. He'll say that the attackers are trampling him. He'll say in verse 2, my enemies are trampling on me all day long. He doubles up on it, if you notice. In verse 1, he says, my enemies are trampling on me. And then he says again in verse 2, my enemies are trampling on me. He is talking about them hotly pursuing him. We'll see that again in verses 5 and 6. He says, all day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. So David recognizes that he is being pursued hotly by this enemy. 
And, you know, I was thinking about some of the struggles that we're going through today as, as this virus is, is taking over this world and coming across our country and, and we're hearing more and more reports of it. And it almost feels like this enemy is pursuing us. And, and we, we hunker down and we get into sheltering in place and we're praying that it will not overtake us. And in some ways, that's exactly what David is doing here. He is struggling with this enemy that is coming against him. So he says, God, be gracious to me because my enemy is pursuing me. But then he also says this in verses one and two, he talked about the fact that for many attack me proudly. That's real important because he's recognizing that not only are they pursuing him, but they are attacking him pridefully. They're prideful. Now, as as they're coming against him, he's recognizing that these enemies are not godly enemies. Saul is clearly not godly, and the Philistines are clearly not godly. They are elevating their own way above God's way. And in 1 Peter, um, Peter had talked about dealing with our anxieties, and he talked about humbling ourselves before the Lord, and that he will deal graciously with us in our lives. And then he says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. So his enemies are pursuing him. His enemies are prideful. And he says again that they're injuring his cause. They're actually speaking evil against him. They're twisting his words. And they're twisting his words against him, his thoughts against him for evil. They're stirring up strife around that they are trying to get people to attack him. And they're lurking and they're watching his steps. And they've waited for his life. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Um, I know that as we've been um, dealing with people around us today, so many people are feeling so fearful of what is happening around them. And they feel like, you know, as as people are walking away, they move away uh, from them because they are afraid that maybe somebody's going to pass this virus on. And in some ways, David is going through the same things. He is, he is fearing that these enemies are going to take over him. So David begins by crying out to God uh, for grace, and, and we need to do the same. But then David moves to placing his confidence in a good God. David placed his confidence in a good God. Watch this where he says in verse 3 and 4, he says, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. You know, I, I like it here because what David does is he is very honest he's acknowledging his feelings. Some of us kind of avoid our feelings. We stuff our feelings. We, we, don't, we don't admit what we're feeling. And, and what I do with my clients oftentimes is I'll ask them to, to grab a journal and to write down the thoughts that you're having, the feelings that you're having, and the actions that you do. And that's what David is doing here in his journal. He says, when I am afraid, he's not, he's not avoiding it. He's not denying it. He says, I am afraid. But then he makes a statement of purpose. I am Put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? You know, I find that there are two paths for fear. Fear follows one path where it is fear, which leads to control, which leads to anger. And that is a path that will lead to great fury in life. And I think that's the path that Saul is on. He was afraid that he was going to lose his kingdom. He started trying to control every event around him. He started to pursue David in anger and fury. But there's a second path that we can choose with fear. And it's instead of fear leading to control of others, it can be fear that leads to self-control, where we are choosing the way we think and choosing the way we speak and choosing the way we act, the fear leads to self-control, which leads to assurance and it leads to faith. And David is also having fear, but his fear, he is controlling himself. He's going vertical and he's trusting God. And he says, I'm not going to be afraid. What can flesh do to me? So what I see David doing is this. David puts his faith in the person of God first. You could see it there. He says, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you, in you, God. So he is putting his faith and trust not in an event, not in a circumstance around him. He's putting his faith in the person of God. But then he also puts his faith in the promises of God. Watch it. He says this, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you, the person of God, and then in God, whose word I praise. 
In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? I think that's probably part of the greatest problem that we have as people is that we do not know the word of God well enough. We do not put our confidence in his word. Sometimes what we do is that as we go through these trying times and these stressful times, we will then try to go to God's word and find a verse of scripture that is there. And as we go to God's word, and it's like we're trying to find a verse of scripture that's going to solve this problem. And the, and the reality is, is that it may not be enough at that moment in time because we are overwhelmed with this fear. But what David had done was he had learned the secret of encouraging himself and assuring himself and strengthening himself by the word of God so that when the attack came, he knew the word. He had built up some spiritual muscle because he studied God's word. He meditated on God's word. He memorized God's word. And he saturated his life in God's word. He knew God's word informationally, but he applied it practically in his life. That's what you and I need to do as we go through these times of great fear. So David says, this in verse 7 for their crimes will they escape in wrath cast down the peoples O god what david does is he says i put my faith in the person of god and in the promises of god and he looks specifically at certain characteristics of god that i want you to think about today the first one he focuses on is that god is a god of justice god is a god of justice he knew that the enemies that were around him were doing evil things, but ultimately God would judge them. They would have to stand before God, and the reality is all of us are going to have to stand before God and have to give an account at one time or another. But it's only those that are in Christ that will stand justified. It is only those that are in Christ that will stand confident of knowing that there's no condemnation. And David says that, I don't know if I'm going to die at the hand of Saul, I don't know if I'm going to die at the hand of the Philistines, but I do know this, that God, you are a God of justice. We need to know that. He went on to say this beautiful verse in verse 8. He says, you have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? But look at that first line. You have kept count of my tossings. God is a God who's aware I want you to know that God is aware of the struggles that you are going through. There is nothing that has ever happened in your life, and there's nothing that will ever happen in your life that God is not aware of, and he acknowledges, he knows. He says, you have kept count of my tossings. A, a better rendering of that would be, you've kept count of my wanderings. God not only judges those that have attacked him, but he's also aware of everything that they've ever done against him. He keeps a meticulous record of every step of your life. God is aware of every person that has harmed you. God is aware of every person that has insulted you. God is aware of every time that your words were twisted. God is aware and he keeps count of your tossings. I, I love that, that God sees you. Be amazed at this, that you are not alone. One, one of the things that David is struggling with here is that he's alone, he's desperate, and he's afraid, but he needs to remind himself that God is aware. The next thing he says is this. Look at the second line. He says, you have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. I want you to know that God is a compassionate God. So, what they used to do in ancient times is that when you would go through great times of grief, you would grab a jar, usually a wineskin, and you would put it under your eye. And as you were crying, you would drop your tears into this wineskin. And when you would go through your times of grief and mourning, what you would do is you would um, close that jar up and it would catch your tears and you would seal it. And it was symbolic of the grief that you've gone through. And David is saying this, that God, you're catching my tears. You know every single one of them. Why? Because he is a compassionate God. You know, in Revelation, in chapter 7, it says, For the Lamb of God is in the midst of the throne, will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. And, and again, in Revelation 21.4, he says, he will wipe away every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, no crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. 
What a precious promise that is, that God is compassionate to you. But David not only um, recognized that, but David recognized this third line. You have kept count of my tossings. You have put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? God remembers. We need to remind ourselves that God keeps a record in his book. He chronicles your pain. He records it. He accounts for it. He registers it. You know, some are tempted to believe that God doesn't care for them. And I, I'm telling you, on the authority of God's word, that God cares for you. It even says in scripture that God knows the number of hairs on your head. God knows everything about you. And so David reminds himself that God remembers. God knows. God is there with him. God is compassionate for him. He says in verse 9 this, Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. I love that line, when I call, because God listens to you. As you go through your times of fear, you, you remind yourself that God is a God of justice and God of awareness and a God of compassion and concern, but God is also a God who remembers and God who listens to you. He hears your prayers. Now, he may not answer them in the way that you desire. He may not answer them in your time period, but God listens to you. And God has given us tools to connect with him, the, the tool of his Holy Spirit who indwells us, the tool of his word, but this tool of prayer to be able to lift our prayer requests to him. It's one of the places that a lot of people fail to do when they're going through great troubles and trials. They don't pray. And I just encourage you to go vertical. God is there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He is there with you because he cares. Look at this last line. Then my enemies will know, will turn back in the day when I call. And then he says, this I know that God is for me. I want you to know that God protects you. So, so God is a God who is going to protect you and be there for you. God is a God, he knows you. This kind of blows my mind, to be honest with you, because he says, this I know, that God is for me. You know, we may know a lot of things in this world, but David knew this thing, that God is for him. This was not just mere knowledge. This was not mere facts. This was not just mere information. It was based on an intimate and personal and deep relationship with God. I know this. It's not superficial. It's deep. It's not temporal. It's lasting. It's not just information. It's practical. It's the witness of God that God has kept his word. He's a promise keeper and we can trust him. And David says this, I know that you are for me, that God, you're going to protect me through this. And once again, I don't know what is going to happen in the future for us as we go through these troubles and trials, but you need to know the God who you can trust in. What do you know? What runs through your mind? What are the fears and the insecurities and the doubts that you have? What we need to know is the God of the word and the God who keeps his word. This I know that God is for me. He goes on in verse 10 and he says this, in God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise. He, he starts with the um, word God, the name of God, Elohim. And then he moves from the general name for God to the covenantal game for God. In the Lord, whose word I praise. He, he's talking about this deep, intimate, faithful relationship that God has with him. And he says, I know this. I know your word. Jesus had said, and it was in De Deuteronomy, that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So what do you know? In God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. You hear it again, that self-control. He's taking control of himself. What can man do to me. Now, man can do a lot of terrible things to us, and, and viruses can do a lot of terrible things to us, but they can't do ultimate things to us. They cannot take our lives spiritually. They cannot take the reward, the inheritance. They cannot take our eternity away from us. They may take us temporarily, but they cannot take us ultimately. Ultimately, 
And that's what David was saying, that David recognized the character of God, of his justice, his awareness, his compassion. He remembers, he listens, he protects. He knew that character of God. We need to know that character of God. But there's one other thing that David saw. See it in verse 13. He says, for you have delivered my soul from death. See the word deliver? God is one who saves. See, see, David was looking for a physical salvation from Saul and a physical salvation from the Philistines. But we recognize that there's a spiritual salvation that God delivers, that God saves. We need to rest in that. We need to rest in a salvation that is so firm and so committed and so faithful to us from what God has done for us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he begins the psalm by talking about he cries out to God for grace, and then he places his confidence in a good God. And the last section is this. The psalmist commits himself to God's calling, a ministry of gratitude. See it right here where he says this. He says in verses 12 and 13, I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before the Lord in light of life. So David has now transformed and he has looked away from the enemies that are around him. He has found himself focusing on the God who is with him, and now he thinks about his calling. He commits himself to God. He says, I must render thank offerings to you. He recognized that he needs to be living a life of gratitude. It's kind of reminding me of what Job says, for I know my Redeemer liveth. And David is saying that I'm going to walk with that God. I'm going to walk with God in light of life. And, and walking is, is kind of like a, a step-by-step action. He is, needs to take action to move towards God. It's about advancement. It's about a manner of life. It's about David trusting the God who is with him and who will never leave him. And because God has rescued us and because God is there for us, we can know that God is for us. So I, I want to end this talk with you today about this. I want you to know that God is for you. See, we struggle with the things that are happening around us. We struggle with fears and insecurities, and we struggle with, is God with us or is God for us? And I can guarantee you that if you are in Christ, God is for you. I think if you remember this phrase, God is for us, it probably reminds you of Romans chapter 8. Right at the end of Romans 8, one of the greatest chapters in the Bible, Paul is probably thinking of David's psalm as he writes it. And he says this in verse 31, What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Those are those who are in Christ. It is God who justifies. What does it mean to be justified? It means that you're declared not guilty. All of your sins, past, your present sins, your future sins are done. God's righteousness has been placed upon you. The righteousness of Christ has been placed on your account. That your worst day, the worst sin, and David, I believe, was sinning initially when he went into Gath. He was, he was fearing. He wasn't trusting in God. When he let spittle run down his faith, he was fearing, not trusting in God. But even that sin was atoned for because he's infinitely loved. He's totally accepted. He's completely forgiven. Now, he may not have known the name of Christ. We do. He was looking ahead to a Redeemer. We're looking back at the Redeemer. Paul went on to say, Christ is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. I want you to be amazed at this, that God is interceding for you today. I want you to know that the Lord Jesus Christ is praying for you today. No matter what your trial or trouble is, the Lord Jesus Christ is at the right hand praying for you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or viruses? For your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, no. 
in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation, including viruses, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is a perfect salvation. That is a God who's purposeful and loves you. That's a passionate Savior, and that's a promise that God is for you. So today, as you may be going through great levels of fear and insecurities, I want you to know a God who loves you is there for you. So cry out to him for his grace. Place your confidence in him as a good God. And then live your life in a way where you are modeling and honoring him in gratitude.